Aloha, and welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii's weekly show about living in an association, not always condos, sometimes homeowner associations. And I'm your host, Richard Emery. Someone asked me how I got to be a host on this show, and I, I guess the sign is because I'm old, because of the fact I've been in the industry for about 30 years, serving on the Legislative Action Committee and boards of our industry and engaged in uh, the growth of our industry over all these years. And uh, one of my roles is a member of the Community Association Institute Legislative Action Committee. Now, CAI, as we all know it, out of Virginia, the headquarters, appoints in each state a legislative action committee. So we have one for the state of Hawaii. It consists of members equally proportioned. So we'll have three homeowners, for example, we'll have three property managers, we'll have three lawyers, three vendors, um, such as an insurance company who represents CAI, who reviews all the proposed legislation each year and basically advocates on your behalf before the legislature to make sure responsible bills get adopted uh, as a part of our law here in Hawaii. In addition to the state responsibility, one person on each committee, meaning the Hawaii LAC, is appointed what they call the federal liaison. That means that person is responsible to be the coordinator between CAI National and the local branch, the local chapter, uh, Hawaii in this case, on all federal legislation. And some may not think there's much federal legislation that affects associations, but there's a lot of it. And so I'm gonna give you a brief report today, what's going on on a federal basis, tie it into some of the things that are going on in other states, because we attend meetings where all the states talk about the trends and priorities in their states and give you kind of an overview of where the landscape is in federal and in some cases state legislation in our industry. I would tell you the buzzword in 2022 is Champlain Tower South. Some of you may not be familiar with that, so I'll give you a brief overview. In Florida, the county of Surfside, a condominium association, high rise, um, collapsed killing, I'm not sure exactly how many people, but more than dozens of people because the building collapsed. And it collapsed because of the failure of its the structural integrity of the building. What I'm gonna call spalling, where uh, if you know buildings and high rises, particularly within that concrete is rebar, which is the structural integrity and if water gets into the concrete, which gets in the rebar, it rusts and, and you lose your structural integrity. So anyway, what happened in Florida was a building that was old. Um, its association did not make the structural repairs necessary to protect the building. And then one evening it collapsed, killing many, many people. And uh, the building is gone. And uh, let me give you an update kind of what the issues are in this, because what happens when you have a problem like that, all of a sudden all over the country, including Hawaii, states run to say, I can't let that happen here and start proposing all sorts of laws, which happened here in Hawaii in 2022, to make sure that boards are protecting the structural integrity of the building. Well, let me go back to Florida for a second and talk about what the issues are and compare them to Hawaii. Number one, in Florida, the association's board of directors cannot assess the owners for repairs without majority approval. So what that means is when the board identified it several years ago, maybe eight years ago, the structural repair is necessary the homeowners were not in favor of it because it was required an assessment because the structural repairs initially were estimated at $9 million and the owners didn't want the assessment. Kind of like the view 
with a few cracks. So the board had the local building department inspect the building who expressed in writing their concern about the structural integrity of the building. But of course, they didn't do any testing. They just looked at all these cracks and said, you know, this is a potential problem. And then what happened is over time, they kept asking over and over again, the board for approval to make the repairs. And now the bill is up to $15 million after all these years and still did not get the approval until a few weeks before the building collapsed. Now, when you compare their law, which basically said that you had to have the homeowner's approval to assess the owners for this repair, that's the first problem with respect to why this building collapsed and why people died because nobody wants to pay an assessment. No one wants to pay more money. We see this battle all the time in condos Nobody wants to pay more money. I'm dealing with another condo here on Oahu today. It's not a high rise. It's, it's mid rise, we'll call it. That some of the owners don't want an assessment to repair the building and they don't want to borrow the money. And so in that case, uh, the board gets to have their hands tied if they need to borrow the money. But the difference is if I can explain it to you this way. In Florida, to make the repair needed the homeowner's approval. In Hawaii, you're obligated as a board to make the repair. There's no thing short about that. In fact, there's a bill before the legislature today that strengthens the responsibility of the boards to maintain the building. Now, in Florida, you had to have the homeowner's approval. In Hawaii, you do not. You have to make the repair. Now, if you want to borrow money to make the repair in Hawaii, you need 50.0% exactly half to consent to a loan. So what happens if the owners don't consent to a loan? The board has the authority because they're obligated to maintain the building to assess you. And so instead of saying you can pay $100 a month for a loan, what they say is you have a lump sum assessment of $10,000 and you've got to pay that within a specified period of time so they can make the repairs. So more times than not, boards in Hawaii go out and say, look, we have to make this repair. We can assess you $10,000. Or if you sign this consent to borrow the money, we'll all raise your maintenance fees $100 a month. Those are examples, by the way, the real numbers would determine what the calculation is. So in Hawaii, that particular problem of Florida doesn't exist because the board had the authority. Now, whether they'd use it or not, is another question. But they had the authority to, to make the repairs uh, without the homeowner's consent. And I would tell you again that in Hawaii right now, there's legislation pending that doesn't really change much to me, but basically reaffirming it's the board's obligation to maintain the building. And frankly, all the mortgage holders, the banks and the, and the mortgage companies that loan money expect you to maintain their collateral. And so that's an integral part of it. The second issue with regard to Florida was that the basic design of the building, there's nothing wrong with the basic design. However, it had unique characteristics on how it was designed that made it more vulnerable to problems if not maintained. So was it built in accordance with the code and structurally correct? Yes. But as the problem and the building began to deteriorate over time, it became a higher risk building than another type of building, which didn't have in the middle of its courtyard, a swimming pool and parking lot, and, and the structural integrity tied into that. So when, when that deck failed, uh, the whole building came like a house of cards and fell down. So in Florida, the issue is that they had to have homeowner approval or in Hawaii you don't. So now we had the big problem, the building collapse, there's all these deaths, there's all this lost collateral in the sense of you're a homeowner and you're fortunate enough not to be home. You've lost your home. You don't have insurance for it. You remember insurance covers perils like hurricanes and fires, but not poor maintenance. So what happened? They lost all their equity. And how about those mortgage companies that had mortgages? Well, they, they would have some claim against the insurance policies, but you know they're at risk as well with respect to this 
to this problem. So anyway, that became a hot topic in the Florida legislature. What are we going to do to prevent this from ever happening again? And there were bills introduced, all sorts of bills, and all sorts of discussion, and all sorts of debate. And let me give you what the Florida legislature did. Pay attention to this. This is what the Florida legislature did to solve this problem. Nothing. In the end, the Florida legislature said, when you look at all the buildings all over our state, this is what we call a one-off. It happened to one building. We haven't had this problem reported by anybody else. Most buildings aren't designed that way. And so they kicked the can down the road and made no decision with respect to um, that by changing the laws. And so essentially they're back to square one that uh, associations still need to get the owner's approval to fix the building. I'm sure that uh, those owners today might be more alert, more aware, it might be easier to vote for it. But in the end, Florida basically said, we're not gonna do anything. It's a one-off. We can't react to um, a single development like that. We kind of did that here in Hawaii with Marco Polo building. We had that massive fire uh, twice in the same building over time. And so all of a sudden our city council comes and passes the uh, fire sprinkler wall, which you have to have life safety evaluation and you have to have it done by certain dates and you have to put fire sprinklers in that should pass certain tests, all because of one major fire, which caused the life and the loss of, uh, well, I wanna say three or four deaths. It wasn't more than four. Um, certainly tragic for anyone to lose their family. But what they did was they all of a sudden the city county here passed all this life safety evaluation, all this stuff. You know what they're doing now, the city council? Rightly so. They're walking it back because of the fact there's not enough engineers, enough people. The costs are extreme. Not every building is designed. You could fire sprinklers in. It becomes a bigger problem than one anticipated. So but in Florida, just so you know, that's kind of how it got started. So what happened on the federal scene with regard to Florida? First of all, there was a bill introduced in Congress recently called the Safer Condo Act. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Safer Condo Act is actually a good deal. What they determined, it's not so true in Hawaii from my experience, but what they determined was that borrowing money to make repairs is sometimes difficult for associations to get. Where HUD, through its government bank, bank financing, has a rehabilitation home loan program that is the bill proposes to open that to condo associations to make structural or safety repairs. So if you had a structural repair, it would qualify it and you know, the bank would get the guarantee by HUD, interest rates would be lower, the terms would be easier. And then on top of that, um, you end up with an opportunity to get a loan Although here in Hawaii, it still needs 50% of the owner's approval. So the Safer Condo Act, and that applies to our fire alarm systems and anything else that would be structural or safety in nature. But if you just want to remodel your lobby or, or do things that are aesthetic or add some new innovation like a hot tub or something by the pool, it wouldn't qualify. It's got to be related to structural repair and safety. And the, and, the, and the bill was just introduced in Congress under the, called the Safer Condo Act. So the other can, problem has been when we had the problem in Florida is HUD, which does these government-backed loans, all of a sudden changed the loan criteria for condo association that they aren't eligible for the most popular loan in the book, a HUD loan, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, if they have structure repairs that are necessary, if in fact they've ever had to evacuate the building, and there's a whole bunch of criteria that I'm not gonna go through today, that basically takes away under the new loan lending requirement guidelines, your ability to get a HUD mortgage if you're an individual buyer and seller out there and you're trying to do regular real estate. And incorporated into that is the reserve study. You know, some people have argued that, well, HUD's guidelines say you just have 10% of the maintenance fees going towards reserves. That's not true. 
that's certainly one of the criteria that might be used, but that's not all of the criteria in determining whether or not um, you have to have a loan. So at the end of the day, on the federal side, and we're gonna take a break after this comment, on the federal side, what we've done is we've seen a collapse in Florida. We've seen Florida do nothing about it. We've seen the federal government get in and implement the uh, proposed the Safer Condo Act, which would make financing for repairs easier, which is a good thing. We've seen HUD basically squash the HUD Fannie Mae Freddie Mac mortgages for condos by putting in criteria that will affect many of the older condos from being able to buy and sell and get traditional mortgages. So that's kind of a scary thing, you know, and you can see that uh, I was on the National Task Force for Public Policy for CAI, where CAI jumped into all of this and put public policy on what your reserve studies to include and not include and what you need to do. So on that note, we're going to take a short break for one minute. Then we're going to come back and talk about some more federal items on the horizon. We'll be back in one minute. Well, I'm back. That was a shorter minute than I thought, but uh, uh, let me just finish up the federal legislation and then talk about what's going on in the industry and what the trends are. But one of the things you may not know is flood insurance, if you're in a flood zone, that bill that authorized the National Flood Insurance Program sunsetted and basically would have died, except it's going through these short-term extensions, including uh, keeping the program alive and in the sense that if that program went away, those of you who are in a flood zone would not be protected because of the fact the flood insurance program was going to go away. The other alternative to that was the rates that they've, like they've already done are going up exponentially because of the no, num, number of claims that are occurring on low-lying uh, flood areas. So uh, right now, the uh, uh, to September 2022, the National Flood Insurance Program has been extended again after extending it again and again. And there's still debate among the Congress about whether to, uh, to, to recast the National Flood Insurance Program. The other program is called Disaster Assistance Equity Act. If you happen to be a condo or a homeowner association and we had a hurricane and you had massive damage to common areas or your roads or things on that line, currently you're not eligible for FEMA insurance. So when a major homeowner association has to clear its roads from tree and debris, there's no money for the federal government to do it. So there's a bill before the government to allow um, um, a, uh, a uh, FEMA to step in. So I got a question from a viewer. And so let me see, read the question to you. Do condos in Hawaii have risks like those in Florida? Are there any condos that are so damaged that homeowners will have to evacuate? Well, I don't know every condo in Hawaii, but I would tell you, I think that we have a lower risk than everywhere else. But because I do reserve studies and, uh, and I've uh, worked with many boards on problems, I can see that if the can gets kicked down the road over and over again, like Florida, you could have a similar problem, you know, and it may not be to the extent what causes loss of life, and but it certainly would cause the evacuation of the building and certainly destroy your property values. So I'm going to tell you up front that I think there are risks by condos or homeowners who don't want to spend the money to maintain the building because they don't want to pay for it now, that, that they can suffer dramatically with respect to um, uh, not maintaining their building, particularly concrete buildings and mid to high rise buildings are very susceptible. Now, being honest with you, uh, I see this all the time, buildings are spalling and cracking, they have to be repaired. And most boards assess and take care of it and do the job they're supposed to do. But um, I am confident there are buildings out there today in Hawaii that aren't near collapse, but have serious issues that need to be addressed that homeowners are debating among themselves what to do about it. So. I would just tell everybody up front that uh, um, uh, you know the National Task Force on Public Policy and the current law before our our, our um, legislature 
emphasizes the need for condo association boards to maintain the building. It's if the law gets passed in Hawaii, where we do a 20 year forecast of reserve requirements, the law changes to 30 years if this law gets passed. And that's a good thing because national public policy is 30 years. And you know what happens when you do 20 years? When people do the reserve studies, they say, I don't have to include that. That's got 25 years life left on it. And so you end up with bigger assessments down the road where the can gets further kicked down the road or ignored. So I think that uh, all in all, you know, that uh, in Hawaii, we don't have the extent of the problem that Florida does, but we certainly have some risk with regard to that area. And thank you for the viewer for asking that question. Now, what's going on in, in general in the other states? Well, all over this country, we had a whole bunch of legislatures uh, introduce um, bills regarding building um, structure safety. Even in Hawaii, we had a bill introduced that has since died that um, said that every five years, you have to have a structural inspection. You have to report it to the building department. And there's all sorts of other things you had to do. I testified against that bill because it's kind of like we keep putting all these burdens on the condo to do all these tests with engineers. And there's not enough engineers in town to do that. I think the bill had, you know, we would have over 900 buildings that have to have a structural investigation. And, and to do that in five years or less would be practically impossible. And, you know, the problem is a lot of these structural things are hidden conditions. You may not see them today, you'll, you'll see them next year. So I don't think that that was really a beneficial way to approach the problem. But across the country, because of Florida, all these bills regarding structural requirements and safety and inspections and double inspections all came about, which probably wouldn't solve the problem. The other thing that we saw throughout, there's really basically three areas we see in the federal government this year, or, or in the states this year. The other had to do with manager licensing. We see that here once in a while, where the managers who serve your condo association would have to be licensed, like a real estate licensee. We had one a couple of years ago where the a real estate commission, uh, not, I shouldn't say the commission, uh, the legislature uh, proposed a bill that all managers of condo associations, meaning the managing agents, had to be licensed real estate brokers. So those individual people assigned to you would have to have a real estate license. Well, the problem with that is, you know, our real estate licensing and training today has nothing to do with condo management. They don't learn anything in that training that would help them in running a condo better. So there was no thought to what the licensing requirements should be. And then you throw in all the types of condos we have from parking condos to industrial condos, to senior living condos, to agricultural condos. Their condo managers have different needs. Some of them are doing fiscal only financial. There's a whole broader topic on that, just to say, let's make them license and have to have a real estate license because the real estate licensing laws aren't designed to do that for here in Hawaii. But we see all over the country, people looking at mandating licensing for the, the condo manager from the management company. The thing that may make sense is registration. The industry itself has a broad educational program. So the, in the, the, having registration and certain ethics criteria they sign on to uh, may be appropriate, but to suggest a massive licensing, but only up to cost the condos because the management companies would have to address that. But there isn't anything in place that doesn't exist already through the industry organization. So uh, that, but that's a hot topic around the country. That's what I'm reporting on. <laughs> the third was an interesting thing on what I call liability. What they were trying to do, we see that here in Hawaii to a degree, they want to impose the liability if something goes wrong on the board and or the management company or both. So what they want to do is say, well, since you're elected and you're responsible, if something goes wrong, then it's your fault and you can be sued. Well, I'm not sure many people would serve on boards if that was the case. Um, number two, you got to recognize that within the governing documents association, the boards are elected, they're homeowners too. They don't have the right to do whatever they feel like doing. And more times than not, they have to have the owner's consent. So what if the owners don't 
give consent like Florida. So, but if you look at the trends in the industry, that's kind of what the trends in the industry are. Basically, Florida caused all the structure repair arguments. Number two, you've got this issue of managers be licensed. I think they should be trained. I think they should disclose their training. I think they should be registered, but um, to throw them just into the real estate licensing laws without some plan doesn't make any sense to me. And then there's the issues of liability because things are going wrong. So it must be the board's fault or the management company. And so that in fact, then in fact, we should uh, hold them responsible. Even to the extent when you look at a structural failure, a management company's not an engineer. They wouldn't know what the severity is of a crack in a wall. They can advise the board to go get an expert, but the board may say, no, we don't want to spend the money this year. So the whole liability issue is, it goes back to management companies or associations or, or self-governance or designed for self-governance where the board itself is responsible, like individual businesses are responsible for the things that go right and the things that go wrong. Summarizing up real quick in Hawaii, I only have a minute left is uh, Hawaii right now, there's about 15 bills left. They overlap. One's about electric vehicle charging stations, making you somehow address that in all sorts of ways. Smoke detector disclosure, buy and sell real estate, you have to disclose that there's smoke detectors and they meet the building code. Assistance animals, there's a couple of bills on assistance animals out there, trying to define what an assistance animal is, basically eliminating the internet vests you buy over the internet. Reserve study issues focused on 30 year requirements versus 20 years. And finally, there's a one bill out there on proxies of voting. Uh, one's, the, one's designed to allow electronic voting and over the internet under certain circumstances. Another, which I think is pretty dead, again, tries to take away the board majority proxy saying that that uh, uh, impairs on people's rights because the boards can control and the homeowners lose their rights even though it's the homeowner who gave the proxy anyway. So anyway, in the 30 minutes I have, I tried to give you an update what's going on in the federal government. I like to share this with you because it tells you how complex our industry is and know that your industry works hard to make sure we have reasonable, meaningful legislation. And thank you for watching Condo Insider today. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.